O Flash Camp Brasil é realizado por Adobe e Action Creations. Patrocínio Platinum, Blackberry Playbook. Patrocínio Prata, Velo Telecom. Patrocínio Bronze, Wacom, Influxes, Chambi, Ria Cycle, The Click. Apoio, Jornada Adobe, Tango, Alternativa Platform, O'Reilly, Abra Web, Rádio Jovem Pan, Faculdade Maurício de Nassau, Marca Viva TV, Linda.com. Boa tarde, pessoal. Vamos começar agora a parte da tarde. Eu quero apresentar para vocês o Matt Snow. O Matt ele é, ele é diretor de criação da Zinga. Essa empresa é bem interessante, que faz vários jogos de Facebook e agora também vários jogos de, de, de celular. Então, com vocês, diretamente lá de São Francisco, Matt Snow. Thank you. Thank you, Damien, for inviting me here. It's a, it's a huge honor to be in Brazil. I, uh, I noticed everyone here is incredibly handsome and beautiful, uh, which, is, which is pretty amazing coming from San Francisco. Has anyone heard of Zynga? Yeah? Okay, good. Uh, we make games, so when I was asked to speak, I thought I would talk about games. I thought I'd talk about social gaming. But the more I thought about it, the more I went down that path, I realized that that topic's been played out, and a lot of people have already spoken about social gaming. Uh, by the way, Demi and I completely changed my presentation. <laughs> Um, so, I noticed you guys are pretty young, and uh, I'm sure you are energetic and passionate about what you're doing right now. So I changed my talk to encourage that, and to hopefully give you guys some, some thoughts and some shortcuts as you advance in your career. Uh, I've been doing this for quite a long time now. I started in 1993, and uh, I know what you're saying. You look so young, how can that be? Uh, but no, really I did, I started back in 93. Um, so I'm gonna talk about instead about my favorite subject, which is me. Um, so I'm actually just gonna talk about my experience in the different jobs I've had. My work isn't especially great, it's, it's average, but I've been very lucky to be at some really great companies and work with some really amazing people. And I've learned a lot working with these amazing people um, and some things I, I thought you could benefit from. So this is where I started out. It's called ASAP Media Services in 93. This was in college. I got kicked out of my first year of college. I had a grade point average of 1.0. And uh, has anyone heard of Motley Crue? Yeah? I, I played Motley Crue way too loud. And so they booted me out of college. And I bounced around for five years. I was a, a bouncer and a bartender and a first mate on a ship. And I worked in a hardware store until I went back to school and uh, got a degree in fine art. So I started this place. There were nine of us. And uh, it was my first introduction to a Macintosh computer in 93. It was Photoshop. 2.5 back then, and I started doing digital design, and used to do a lot of illustration back then, and I used to illustrate the school newspaper, would scan my drawings in and retrace them in Illustrator. It was a really great job uh, to be in college and to do, although that was my first experience of having to fire somebody, and uh, it happened to be one of my best friends, so it was, it was pretty uncomfortable at the time. So I, I put out some really bad work during that time. Used to do a lot of 3D work, a lot of 3D animation back then, a lot of illustration, a lot of book covers and, and uh, t-shirts and, and bookmarks and all of that. This was my first website I designed, uh, which, which I coded in Director um, back then using Lingo, and I had a lot of QTVRs in it, and uh, everything I did back then was a giant image map which was horrible for usability. So what did I learn uh, in college? Well, I learned design. I learned graphic design. 
And I learned the basic design rules that I would later hopefully um, break quite often. The rules of balance and of rhythm and about repeating things over and over, proportion and scale, uh, unity and how the human brain organizes information, contrast, juxtaposition, the rule of thirds, which I'm sure you've all heard of, typography, visual weight, everything that goes into graphic design. Uh, also learned about sharing my work with others and not being afraid to put my work in front of other people. We used to do a lot of art critique where you would put your painting up on the wall and everyone would basically shit all over it. And, uh, and it really thickens your skin. It really makes it so you're not afraid to show your work to others. And too many people I see will work on something for a long time before they show it to anybody. And you have to be really, really, really good in order to do that. Because your work is almost always going to benefit from sharing it with others in the early stages. I learned that uh, sketching and drawing is a very good thing. Uh, I had an old colleague who said, if you're not sketching, then you're not thinking. And so I always sketch on a notebook now. I sketch on a whiteboard. I, I doodle uh, when I should be paying attention in meetings. I learned about iterating. I drew a, a character for a newspaper, a cartoon, and my boss back then said, well, that's, it's nice, but draw it 40 more times. And I said, 40 more times? That's ridiculous. He goes, well, how do you know you got it right if you don't try all the other times? And that's something that stuck with me for a long time, um, to iterate over and over. Unless everyone in here can nail it the first time, then you'll always find different angles and different opportunities to make it better. And I learned how to be self-sufficient. Back then, people weren't specialized. So if, if I needed to put audio into a presentation, I had to learn about audio. I had to learn about video in 3D, in illustration, in, in layout, and animation. And so I learned to become self-sufficient and learn all of this for myself. The only thing I couldn't learn very well was action script. I'm a horrible action scripter. So that I could never really figure out. For then I went to a newspaper company uh, that had the first new media division uh, in the country, Guy Gannett. And I worked there for one year. And in one year's time, I hand-coded and designed 140 websites. These are horrible websites, though. Um, don't be impressed. It's what we call brochureware, where it's maybe one, two, to three pages. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to show you some of them. This is horrible, horrible stuff. Uh, giant image maps, like no usability. You could never search for this and find this uh, because everything's an image. Really poor choices of colors on my behalf. That was for a tire company. Um, just really crazy layouts that don't really read well. Giant, like I said, giant image maps, basically making people guess where to go. This is for a local radio station. Uh, tell me if you can find the navigation on that page. It's pretty bad stuff. But I learned to be really fast, right? I learned that the faster I went, the better I became because I could really iterate really quickly. I learned to reuse code and reuse design and keep libraries on my hard drive. So I could go and get little snippets of code and little uh, design examples so I didn't have to rethink everything every time. And I learned that design is about communicating a message. And in order to achieve that goal, you have to be really, really clear what that message is and what your client wants. And that's something that I did not do well at this job because I never talked to the client. We had salespeople that talked to the client. For then I, I went on in 1998 to Aurora and Quanta Productions. Um, they're a stock photography agency. Uh, they have photographers for National Geographic and Time Magazine, Sports Illustrated. 
And I was their new media designer. Uh, I was actually their entire new media division and did a lot of websites as well, but started to get into Flash and started to, to make these experiences in Flash, um, which are pretty crazy experiences. I'm not sure if you can see up there. One of these numbers is red, and that's the only way you could get into this site is by clicking on the red number. Horrible usability um, back then. And I figured, well, if I can figure it out, everyone else could figure it out. So clearly, you would click on those angles in order to navigate through this, right? I mean, it's very clear. And you would certainly click on the, the letters E, D, C, and B there. Um, just crazy, crazy stuff I was doing back then. So what did I learn at this job? Well, I started to learn about storytelling and narrative, and that you could really tell pretty good stories through Flash, because you could include audio and video and text and images and marry them up to an, an amazing presentation that the sum was greater than the parts. I also learned that I had a really good manager back then. I had a, a guy who believed in me and cared about me and let me come up with ideas of my own and figure things out. And so I understood the value of having a really good manager at the time. So my good friend uh, who I'd worked with at this company moved down to San Francisco and started working at a company called Quokka Sports back then. And I got a call from them six months later. They're, they were a web company that covered extreme sporting events. Uh, things like extreme uh, racing around alone, Whitbread, and they covered the Olympics as well. So I got a call, and in, in 1998, I moved down to San Francisco, started working. It was amazing in 1998 in San Francisco. Uh, everyone was involved in the web, and you could tell everyone that was involved in web design because we all had really funky glasses and, and nice shoes and strange facial hair at the time. And Quokka was uh, one of the poster children for an internet company. So uh, how did that get in there? Um, so this was a website I started on. It was the Marathon to Saab. And we told stories. We told of this brutal race through the Sahara Desert. It's a 150-mile race, six days through the Sahara. Temperature is reaching 120 degrees. And the photographers over there would upload these photos every night. And uh, my team and I would go in, grab the photos, grab the text, and create these stories. And we really didn't have time to design these stories. So we just basically let the photos shine through. So I learned a lot about simplicity and about letting the content speak for itself. Also learned a lot about data visualization back then. We had GPS devices on some of the, some of the runners, and I would go in and, and hand create these GPS maps using XY coordinates based on GPS coordinates, do some transparent GIFs back then. It was pretty, it was pretty crazy. Uh, now it's much easier. Learn more about storytelling. This was one of my designers, M Michelle Shaman, who ran the race. Uh, she didn't really prepare well for it. She, uh, <laughs> she would light jog around the building wearing a, a weighted knapsack. I'm like, Michelle, this is a 150-mile race through the Sahara. She's like, I'll be fine. Turns out she wasn't fine. And uh, this was her after they're, when they're looking at a blister she got in her foot. And I, I say blister, but that was the blister. So sorry you all um, just ate, but it was pretty brutal at the time. But again, it was a, it was a story, and uh, it was a pretty compelling story. And there's more blisters from, from feet at the time. So I started using those storytelling techniques and applying them to big brands. This was for GM, the car company, and I uh, wound up designing their auto show. The only reason I show this slide is because in 2000, this was the prototype for the Toyota Prius. 
which is kind of interesting how it turned out. I went on to design the NBC Olympics website, which was a pretty huge site. It was about 30,000 pages of content. Uh, I wound up hand coding and designing a good majority of that. And we used data visual visualization. We used Flash a lot. Uh, we used Flash to show the runner's cadence, um, show photos as they're uh, positioned in the race. Maurice Green from USA, you can see the green dot, he's in the lead. And Flash was great for that. I mean, you could, you could create graphics based on numbers, and that was pretty cool. Use Flash to tell stories and uh, do as much as I could with what little content I was getting from the field with audio and, and photos. We also let the athletes tell their own stories. We gave them cameras, and we let them um, email up their updates, which is pretty funny because they were really short little updates, uh, 140 characters or so back then. Uh, wish we had Twitter, of course. And then wound up after the Olympics redesigning cart.com and, and a few other things, but learned a lot at this company. And again, I learned that content is king. And it's not about your fancy, glassy buttons. And it's not about the fun UI you make. If you don't have good content, you're screwed. I learned about conviction. And at the time, I had a difficult decision to make. And I had to tell my team the difficult decision. And I approached my boss, and I told him about this. And he said, Whatever decision you make, say it with conviction. And that stuck with me uh, to this day, where if you have to make a decision and you have to say something, say it with conviction. Say it like you mean it. Say it from the heart. And people will believe it. You can later change your mind, uh, but don't be the wishy-washy one who hems and haws and doesn't quite uh, say things with the passion that you need to say them with. I also learned about fear of failure, and this is something that I struggled with up until this point. I would be scared to show people my work, and I would be scared that people wouldn't like it. And a lot of people have a fear of failure, and they don't want to put their work out there because they're afraid it will fail. And I guarantee you that it will, and it will even if you don't think it will. But the more you put out there, the more hits you're going to have. And uh, sometimes they don't fail, and sometimes they do really well. But don't be afraid to keep putting it out there. Keep putting it out there, and let people see it, and don't be afraid of failure. And I learned that uh, if everyone on your team is passionate, then you get a better product. And if you are not passionate about what you do, if you guys in here are not passionate about where you're going, you need to find something else to do because this industry is all about passion. And if you're not loving your job, you have to ask yourself, how can I love my job? What can I do to change it to love my job? That's why I tell people when they, when they apply for positions in mobile, I say, you have to love mobile. You have to be passionate about mobile because mobile is hard. And there are constraints. And it's a pain in the ass but you better love it or else you're not going to have any fun. And I also learned about testing myself. And uh, my boss gave me a choice after the Marathon de Saab to design America's Cup race or the Olympics. Easy or hard? And Olympics was going to be hard in long hours. Uh, one, one week I worked 125 hours, which was pretty ridiculous. Um, and he told me, he said, look, you make your own decision, but when faced with a fork in the road, always choose the harder path. And that's something I do to this day. I always choose the, the harder path because it tests yourself and it challenges you. And you're always going to come out better for it. You can take the easy way out, but you'll always kick yourself in the ass for not taking the harder road. 
So then the internet died, and uh, everything went downhill. Everyone lost their job in San Francisco. All my friends left. It was pretty brutal, and that was in 2001. So I, so I worked for myself. Uh, I became a freelancer. And uh, I did some really crappy work as a freelancer. This was my first mobile application, uh, which was a weather app. And it was, it was really tiny. Uh, back then, the screens were really small. I did some other stuff. Um, this was something from Macromedia. It was supposed to be called the Universal Communicator. Uh, it was a predecessor to Macromedia Central, which was a predecessor to Adobe Air. Uh, so that's the story behind that. I did some websites. And uh, things got really hard, so I had to do things like design Barbie stuff. Uh, did hotel website. So what did I learn? I learned I am a terrible freelancer. I cannot work for myself. Some people can. God bless you all that can, but I'm horrible. Like, there's always something to eat in the fridge. My cats always need attention. There's always a video game to play. I'm, I'm just the worst person to work at home. Luckily, Macromedia hired me in 2003. And... Uh, I was pretty honored because I was a huge fan of Flash. I used Dreamweaver a lot back then as well. And so I started with Macromedia as an interactive art director, which meant I uh, was the, the design lead for the website back when it went through a redesign. I also did a lot of, uh, I was the art director for the Edge newsletter and did a lot of the Flash work in there. And I started to move over to the marketing team and started to do these big flash presentations and flash videos. That's Kevin Lynch from Adobe. You may recognize him. Uh, back when he was talking about the flash platform. So I started to learn After Effects. I started to learn uh, more about flash and about setting up my movies um, for a lot of interactivity. Wound up uh, leading to the design on the Studio 8 experience. This is a big flash. This is when you could um, embed video that didn't have to have a, a bounding rectangle. So we cast a bunch of models in green screen, had them walk to the front of the stage and present their stuff. And uh, wound up doing uh, getting into f photography back then, so I ordered some Italian food and, and did a photo shoot. Also at Macromedia, um, I won the, the mustache contest. I just want to point this out. That uh, that's me on the on the front. So ladies, if you want to sign copy of this photo after this presentation, form a single line. I will probably stretch through the doors, but just don't block everyone when they try to leave afterwards here. So what did I learn at Macromedia? Well, I learned about KISS, right? Keep it simple, stupid. That's a saying that we use in design. And to really simplify, because when you're selling product on a website as big as Macromedia, you need to simplify. You don't want to get in the way of that product. I also, thank God, learned about usability. And this is something that I didn't really know much about before. So I learned information architecture. I learned that people read the screen a certain way. I learned that giving space around things is, a, is good to do and not cramming the screen with content. And I learned about teamwork. And there's nothing like the feeling of being on a kick-ass team and producing great work. I love the feeling of having a strong team and everyone contributing. Uh, to me, that's, that's amazing, although I will say that um, you have to be careful in teamwork because you know one rotten egg can make the whole thing stink. So if you don't have a good team member, then you have to do something about that. So Adobe purchased Macromedia. And we were all pretty scared at Macromedia because we didn't know what was going to happen. Um, this is how I used to work at Macromedia. I used to dress up, obviously. And uh, <laughs> then all of a sudden, we see all these people walking around with suits on. We're like, this is kind of weird. Um, why would you wear a suit to work? 
unless somebody had died. So I'm, I was still on the art director for the uh, marketing team, still doing a lot of flash work, a lot of flash video, a lot of interactivity. I uh, started directing video back then and uh, writing some of this, this stuff. And uh, we started getting a mobile on, on Flash as well. And uh, it started showing off that Flash, Flash Lite could live on a mobile device and perform relatively well. Wound up redesigning the Edge newsletter on Adobe. Has anyone ever seen this before? Probably not. But it's a newsletter, it lives on Adobe, and it has a lot of great articles and a lot of great how-to videos. So if you guys ever do go here, you'll learn a lot about Flex, about Flash, uh, excuse me, Flash Builder, and, and about all sorts of, of wonderful topics. Wound up doing a CS3 experience where we let people test out the new features of CS3 um, using uh, this interactive dashboard uh, that was all done in Flash. That was pretty exciting. And then I moved to the experience design team. Now Adobe is set up where they have over 100 designers all in basically one spot. And they design all of Adobe's products. They design the software, and they design uh, the experiences that Adobe makes for other people. And uh, they design a lot of the internal Adobe stuff that you guys never see. So I wound up being asked to manage the mobile and devices design team, which I didn't have really any experience in mobile, and I didn't have any experience in management. So it was kind of a double whammy. So I jumped on that team, and we started to just spit the work out. We, uh, we did a lot of multi-screen experiences back then. And uh, you can see some of the stuff up here. I won't go through it all, but uh, our whole mantra was multi-screen. We wanted you to look at stuff on the phone and see it on the TV and then see it on your, your PC and then have it all talk together. And it's a dream that's, that's being realized today. Um, and it's pretty amazing to see it happening. Wound up working on Adobe Nitro, which was all about widgets at the time. And this was all done with Air. So we had Air application running on the desktop. And that was real time synced with Air running on a mobile device and Air running on the TV. So you did one on one thing, and it would just, the, uh, it would, if I started watching a movie here, I could watch it here and here. And you could drag widgets from a website down to your desktop, which would then turn into an application. It was crazy. Um, the project got killed, thankfully, because it was a little complex. Wound up doing some mobile work, uh, video trailer application for Sony Pictures. My team designed uh, Adobe Photoshop.com mobile which is uh, still being updated today. It's a, a mobile application for enhancing your photos, editing your photos. I started designing the, it was called Flex Mobile Framework back then. So the idea of having uh, Flex build your mobile apps for you. We did some fun things like we, we kind of thought up our own Air marketplace. So if you could just purchase Air mobile applications, what would that look like? And over here, uh, we wanted to give the idea that when you rotate your phone, that we're going to give you use cases. So I want to play a game, have fun with photos, watch something, connect with friends. And as you drag that and rotate it around, your choices would change and instead of just having a big list of, of content. So thinking about it a little bit differently. This was an application that we designed for the New York Times, uh, which allowed you to watch video on your mobile device and tap a button and have it sent to your TV uh, at the same point you were watching on your mobile device. And then when you're watching on your TV, 
you can pull up related articles that would then, when you entered on your TV remote, be sent down to your desktop, which is a desktop application, New York Times reader, and it would load up the article. And then from the article, you could load up another video to either device. So it was an interesting multi-screen experience there. And then, uh, my final thing I worked on was the Adobe Max conference application that was on Android and iPhone and desktop and tablets. So what did I learn there? Well, uh, <laughs> I learned to give credit to people. Um, I'd been a little selfish in the past, and I used to worry that I wasn't getting credit for my work. And I was kind of whiny about it. And I realized that that was the wrong way to think about it. So I started being really good about giving credit to other people. And not uh, sometimes not giving credit is as bad as falsely taking credit. So I learned to always make sure to give credit to my people. Um, and, and my boss knew what I was doing for work. I didn't have to take credit. I learned that I had always worried as a designer that I didn't know ActionScript. And I was horrible at it. And I worried and worried and worried. So I took a ton of ActionScript classes. And then I realized that I shouldn't try to worry about my weaknesses. I should try to make my strengths better. What am I really good at and make those better? And so that's how I, I work with my team now. I don't care if they don't know ActionScript or something else. I do know what they're really good at, and I make that better uh, so they can become really strong. I, I learned about management and how to manage people. Um, not the best manager, but um, I learned that it's good sometimes to focus on the daily wins so everyone feels like they're making progress. I learned to be a human shield to protect my team, to let them work and not expose them to all the uh, political stuff. I learned when to be assertive, when to back off, and I learned trust, to trust my team to do whatever they need to do to get the job done and not tell them how to do it. So I needed more of a challenge than I was getting at Adobe in my current job. And, uh, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. I have one last thing that I learned at Adobe, which is a prototype. And, and this is something I'd never done before. Basically, in every job I had before Adobe, we would, as designers, toss the design over the wall and let the engineers just have at it, right? And then the engineers would work on it for a couple months and we'd get it back and we'd look at it and we'd look at the original design and it was like, what were you guys looking at? Um, and that method doesn't work well at all. So we started working with the developers and they were on our team. And my design team had as many developers as designers. And we started using Agile method of programming. And we used to prototype whatever we could get up there built as quickly as possible so people could use it. And that's how you find out if something works or not, if people use it. So we would rapidly prototype these applications in Air, which is great for rapid prototyping. And we'd get it functionally working. And then you'd realize that some of the features that you wanted to go out the door with, that you held off, they don't really matter because you don't need those features. Or maybe some of the features you thought would be kick ass turn out to suck because you've used this application. Instead of just worrying about a schedule, you now are worried about the product and you're using it and everyone's given feedback. So Rapid prototyping is key, in my opinion, to, to great product. So, so Adobe was great, but after seven years, I, I said goodbye and uh, sought a bigger challenge and went to Zynga. And uh, I had played Zynga games. I had about $7 million in Zynga poker. Um, I was level 33 in Farmville. Don't ask me why. Um, and I became the art director uh, for the mobile division at Zynga. And uh, Zynga makes a lot of games, Cityville and Farmville. 
Frontierville, probably most popular, Zynga Poker. And Zynga, <laughs> you know, at Adobe, my work would reach a certain audience, certain amount of people, and I was pretty happy about that. Cityville, when it launched in the first 41 days, hit 100 million players a month, which is ridiculous amount of people. Overall, over 300 million people uh, play Zynga's products a, a month, and, and that's uh, pretty crazy. For Cityville, the, that number means that one out of every six people on Facebook is playing Cityville. This is a t-shirt I had made when I started there. Um, shows the kind of crazy amount of games that, that we work on. So our mobile games are, we have some sort of uh, RPG-ish type games, Vampires and, and Mafia Wars. We have Farmville on your, your iPhone where you can click and hold and drag around your crops to plant your crops and to seed. We have Scramble, which is a word game, and we have Drop7, which is a, 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 word, or a number puzzle, number game on your phone. This is a game that we recently launched, Mafia Wars. It's, it's an HTML5 game. And uh, it's interesting to work in HTML5 uh, because it's so limited. You really can't do a whole lot yet on mobile. This is a poker game that we have on the, on the iPhone and on Android. And, uh, and this is a really popular game. I, I wound up designing this one. This is a, this, I love poker. That's why I designed it. Um, Words with Friends. Maybe some of you have heard Words with Friends. Uh, this has over 3 million players a day on this application. So what I learned with uh, at Zynga so far, I've only been there six months, but that six months has been like six years at another company. Uh, they move so quickly. So I learned about ownership. I learned that our mantra at Zynga is to be your own CEO. And that carries a lot of weight at this company. When I started, nobody told me what to do. They gave me a desk. And I don't ask anyone what to do. I figure it out. And I have to figure it out because you have to be your own CEO. And I, at other jobs, I would sit there, and if I didn't have anything to do, I would maybe do a tutorial, or I'd surf the web, or I'd sleep. Um, but at Zynga, you know, you have to really own yourself and own your priorities. And uh, it's a really good thing to get into that mindset. I learned how to prioritize my work. In the past, a lot of times, I would, when approached with a big project, I would work on the easy stuff first, sometimes called the low-hanging fruit, right? You work on the easy stuff, and you get the little stuff out of the way. But now when I work, I ask myself, is this the most important thing I should be working on? And I always ask myself that now. Because if it's not the most important thing, then I shouldn't be working on it. And you find when you do that, when you work on the most important thing, that the little stuff kind of clears itself up or goes away. And so I encourage everyone here to work on the, the most important thing. And once you've realized what that is, if you have more than one, Prioritize it and work on the hardest thing first. And uh, the, big, the big thing about Zynga, we always ask ourselves, is it fun? Is this fun? Applications, are they fun? If your applications, if your games aren't fun, people aren't going to use them, right? Who wants to use something that isn't fun? If they have to use it, if it's Excel and they have to use it, okay. But when given a choice, people will always choose something that's fun. So try to put those little fun things in, whether it's a motion design, whether it's a, a noise, a sound effect, whether it's a, a color that makes it seem a little more fun than it is. Always think about a good user experience. 
In our games, we have to make sure that the user knows what they're going to do in the first few steps. And more and more applications are doing this. It's called the first time user experience. It's really important. If someone comes and opens your application and they don't know what to do or what to click on, they're going to leave. And you'll see a lot of people leave. We know people leave. We test. We track everything at Zynga. We have a ton of analytics that we use to uh, tell us where people are dropping off. And people will drop off if you don't tell them what to do in your application or your game. And they will drop off if you're not pointing out where to click on first. And a lot of mobile apps are doing this now. You'll notice there's an arrow pointing what to click on first. The screen darkens out and only leaves the, the, a button that's bright to tell you to tap that first. People don't mind a little step through tutorial. And I also, um, finally, this is the last thing, I learned that I don't like email. And I used to use email all the time. I used it as a crutch. And even if someone was two desks down, I would email them or IM them or Skype them, right? I'm like, didn't want to talk to them face to face. Now when I get emails, I stand up, I walk to their desk and I talk to people and I get so much more done. It's amazing how much more you get done when you talk to people in person. Um, I probably don't have to tell this to you guys. Brazilians are the, the chattiest people I've ever met in my life. Uh, took me an hour to get through a lunch line. So, and I don't even speak Portuguese. Um, so you guys probably don't have to worry about that. So I said a lot here, and I didn't really focus on, on uh, any one particular thing. I know it's a lot of information. Uh, this was everything I talked about, which is a pretty big list here. So, you know, I hope that you guys have maybe gotten something out of this. Um, I'm sure you have things you could teach me. I don't know everything at all. I'm still learning. I'm learning every single day uh, in this field, but I love it so much. I love, I have a lot of passion around design and around user experience. Um, that I'll be in it for the rest of my life, uh, unless I lose my mouse finger. And uh, so I'm going to open it up now. If you guys have any questions, if you want to talk about any of these, if you want to give any tips to me, it would be much appreciated. So thank you very much. Vamos abrir para pergunta, então. Perguntas? Aqui. Uh, first, uh, congratulations for your presentation. Thanks for the hints. Uh, I'd like to know your opinion about uh, any kind of stuff made uh, based on social networks. Uh, how deep uh, this will affect people's life in the end of this decade. I'm not sure if I understood 100%. Are you talking about social? Any kind of stuff uh, made based on social networks, like uh, uh, APPs, social games, like right. you. Okay. How deep it will affect people's life in, in the next decade? So, so the question is... So th the question was, how, how deeply will social networks and social gaming affect people this decade? And there are studies that have been done about how social networks affect people. And people used to think that that social games and social networks isolate people because all of a sudden you're on the computer and you're, you're tweeting and you're posting to Facebook or whatever. But they have found that it, it increases your social network and you wind up talking to people more and people connect more. I play Cityville with an old high school buddy I haven't seen in 20 years. I have other people from high school I haven't seen in 20 years. 
and, uh, and I'm developing friendships with them because I play games with them and there's a social network. And so just like here at this conference, you connect with someone through a social network, you meet them in person, and you develop a friendship. And so I think social networks definitely improve your own real life face-to-face -face social networks. I'd like to know something about the future, something that still uh, doesn't happen today. Doesn't happen oh, you today. want me to predict the future? <laughs> all right, mm, let's see. You're all going to be rich and famous, rich and famous. <laughs> I don't know. I. Uh, <laughs> It didn't happen to me, so then again, it's probably not true. Um, I honestly couldn't tell you what the future holds for social networks. I do know that um, about 30% you know, of people play games, PC games, console games. The stuff that Zynga makes, the 70% of the other people play those games. And so now, a lot of people play games. Our target is a 43-year-old woman at Zynga. That's who plays our games, right? You would never expect a 43-year-old woman to be playing games. So I think the future holds a lot in gaming. And applications are starting to turn to gaming. Uh, social games are the best of both worlds because you play with friends. That's the definition of a social game. You play with friends. And you get to interact with that friend through something that's really, really fun. And I think that's just going to get better and better and better as games get better and better and better. That's my prediction for gaming, at least. So, Any other questions? Or are we out of time? Okay. Any other questions or comments? Uh, okay. Uh, obrigado pela palestra. Eu gostei muito. É, eu, eu gostaria de saber se vocês da gringa desenvolvem todos os jogos ou se vocês recebem também material externo, por exemplo, um desenvolvedor teve uma ideia e como é que vocês, se vocês aceitam esse tipo de, de proposta e como é que funciona o sistema assim, essa questão? Thank you. Uh, at Zynga, we come up with our own ideas for games, although, you know, certainly, um, as in all gaming, a lot of them have been influenced by existing genres. We don't really accept external game ideas, but we do use external companies for game development. So if any of you are game developers, Zynga does outsource some of its work. Um, but we don't, uh, we have a lot of game designers in-house, and so we don't really take other people's ideas from outside. There would be a lot of legal issues around that. We wouldn't be allowed to do that. Um, did Zing ever think to make a social game based on a social network or it had plans to make one, like Second Life? Uh, so the question, you know, will Zynga make its own social network? And I think you're starting to see some of that reveal itself um, through Rewardsville we just launched, which allows you to uh, see your friends that play other games, other Zynga games, all in one spot, and collect rewards for playing other Zynga games. I would say that's the start of our social network, but you know we owe everything to Facebook. That's the, that's the biggest uh, thing, the gratitude that we could have is through Facebook, because a lot of people play our games through Facebook. And uh, right now, I think it would be foolish to try to compete with Facebook. Um, but we are trying to tie our players together. And so if you play one Zynga game, you should be able to see what games they, other games they play. And, uh, and when you start to do that, when you start to expose the other games people play, then you start to create a, your own kind of social network. Bom, meu nome é Carlos e eu gostaria de saber qual é a possibilidade de vocês começarem a desenvolver também jogos 3D para redes sociais. Sim. 
So, th so yeah, 3D gaming for social networks, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, think, I think it'll happen, absolutely. Um, you know, with, with Flash and 3D, that's, a, that's a, you know, m most definitely. Uh, we haven't done it yet because it's, the value hasn't been there yet. The cost benefit hasn't been there yet. Um, but, you know, for, for something like Cityville, all the graphics for Cityville were created in 3D. And then what we do is we just spit out a sprite sheet or a, a flip book and we bring that into Flash and we, we animate everything in Flash. But, but all, the, all the characters and everything else uh, done in 3D. Outra pergunta aqui. Eu digo assim, em 3D da seguinte forma, melhorando a experiência do usuário para os jogos nas redes sociais. I definitely think it's possible. Um, Sony tried to do this with their, their, uh, their home product, um, using 3D to improve the social network. And other, other companies have done it as well. I just own a PS3, so that's where I, I got that example from. But it's pretty horrible. Um, <laughs> you know, just going out and meeting strangers on the internet is pretty scary. Um, they will insult you the second you start talking to them. Um, so, so for Zynga, we try to keep it to people that you actually play games with and you actually know. And if we can use 3D um, to let you walk around, say if it's a family sim game, to walk around and talk to your actual friends, that would be a benefit to us to do. Um, or, you know, you could also think of 3D in, in, in navigating through space and through games. I don't know. I'm brainstorming now, but I'm sure there's a lot of possibility for that. Hi. When you look at social games uh, like Cafe World or Restaurant City, they all look alike, the HUD are the same, the uh, user experience is very, very alike between them. Is there a study of why they look so, so alike? So that's a, that's a great question. Why do all of our games look alike? Great question. A um, bunch of different answers. Uh, one is, why break it? If, it? if it isn't broken, don't fix it. Um, we, we don't want people to have to figure out what to click on in the HUD. So, in fact, you're gonna, my goal is to start standardizing even more, where your energy bar is always at the same place. You know, your coin bar is always at the same place, because that starts to create a pattern of usability that people can adapt to and learn with our games. And it's not about that stuff. It's about the content. It's about the gameplay. And so, um, we also have artists, right? So I have a bunch of artists on my team that hand draw these characters and, and, and really draw all the animation out. And they tend to sometimes switch teams and go in different games. So you'll see the same style sometimes going from one game to another. And uh, a lot of the same type of animations, you know, kind of uh, are carried through because someone is actually doing it in-house and they just like that style. Um, but yeah, we should absolutely standardize on the games. Not the colors, but just where that HUD is and all the elements on there. I definitely think that's, that we should do that. Thanks. I love your coffee here, by the way. It's amazing. Um, the first thing I would like to know is, uh, I don't know if you said this at the start, because I wasn't here, maybe missed a few minutes. Um, what kind of technology do you use on Zynga games, as in everything, um, all, all through the, um, when you design it until you code it? So um, I don't know the answer to 100%. I can tell you from, from what I know that we use. Uh, a lot of our artists draw in Flash. Our best artists, uh, well, some of our best artists draw in Flash, which is pretty funny. Um, and, uh, and so we you know we'll use Studio 3D Max for a lot of the 3D. Maya is used for 3D work. Um, Flash, of course, all of our games are in Flash uh, on the web. Since I'm in mobile, 
we, we uh, use native applications, so for iPhone and for Android. Um, HTML5, we're starting to get into that more. Uh, we use Photoshop. For, for something like Farmville, everything is hand-drawn in Photoshop using shape layers because they're vector and they can scale. My artists draw in Photoshop um, with a tablet and using uh, shape layers because they're vector. I use fireworks for UI design. Uh, that's just something I'm accustomed to. I force my team to use fireworks now, so they had to learn that. And, uh, and they were using Illustrator before for a lot of UI work, um, which is, do not recommend using Illustrator for UI work. Recommend using fireworks. And uh, so I've had to relearn Photoshop myself because they use that for a lot of art. Uh, what else do we use? Um, We don't have very, you know, I think that's about it. I'm trying to think. The 3D, Flash, uh, Fireworks, Photoshop, Illustrator. Yeah, that pretty much covers everything. Anyone else? O que que você recomenda? Do you the headphones? O que, que você recomenda assim para um estudante que está começando agora aqui para um dia? Qual seria um conselho de carreira para de agora até chegar um dia, quem sabe, numa Zinga, numa Adobe, numa Macromedia? So what do you guys, so how do you guys get a job, right? Um, how do you guys, if you guys just graduated, if anyone here has just graduated, how do you get a job? First of all, um, have a really good website where it shows off your best work. Even if it's just two or three pieces, don't show the crappy stuff. Weed that out. Don't show your figure drawings from art class, okay? Don't show some portrait painting that you did that's, your aunt told you was good. Show two or three really, really good pieces on your website and come up with a, a pretty good resume and put that up there as well. And, and start to uh, really think about what you want to do and tailor your resume for a certain position. If you see a position at, say, Adobe, then do your research and uh, Find out what that position entails and write your resume for that position, write your cover letter for that position, and show work that is suited for that position. If, you're, if you want to be a database engineer, don't show figure drawings. If you want to be an interactive designer, don't show you know, pamphlet layout. Tailor your work for the job. Um, networking, getting to know people, getting to know me, getting to know Daniel, getting to know anyone else that's in this room here uh, that already works in the industry is a really good idea because when we're thinking, oh, man, who can I get? Who can I, I, I wait, I know somebody. Or, you know, recommendations. I've, I've gotten all my jobs because I know somebody. Not because I'm, I'm great at what I do. It's because I, I know people that work at those places and I try to reach out and I try to make friends with a lot of people. And people remember that. You know, you do, you do something good for somebody, and they'll return the favor. Um, that's the most I can say. Então é isso. Eu queria agradecer. Thanks a lot, Matt.